By 1943, the tide of World War II had turned against Germany. On the Eastern Front, the Red Army had clawed back the ground it had lost, pushing westward with a force that seemed unstoppable. In North Africa, Rommel's once proud Africa Corps was gone, defeated by Allied troops who now controlled the Mediterranean. And in June of 1944, the Western Allies stormed the beaches of France, opening a new front in the very heart of Europe. What Adolf Hitler had dreaded for years had come true. Germany was now fighting a three-front war. The Wehrmacht had always feared this nightmare scenario, knowing the Reich simply lacked the manpower and resources to sustain such pressure. The war that had once been fought on Germany's terms was now closing in from every direction. As the losses mounted, the strain on the German war machine became overwhelming. Factories struggled to keep up as raw materials ran short. Fuel was scarce, pilots were in short supply, and thousands of young men were being thrown into battle with less and less training. Every division, every squadron, every unit was stretched thin. In this climate, a kind of panic set in, both in the corridors of power and inside the aircraft plants. The old calculations of cost, time, and practicality were abandoned. Instead, engineers and military planners were told to chase anything that might offer salvation. Wonder weapons became the obsession. Powerful new machines that, it was hoped, might reverse the Allied tide and buy Germany more time. Some of these ideas were bold, many were reckless, and all of them were born out of desperation. If there was one thing Germany became known for during the war, it was its obsession with wonder weapons. Time and again, engineers were tasked with building machines so massive or so outlandish that they seemed more like science fiction than battlefield tools. The most famous of these was the Schwerer Gustav, a railway gun so enormous it required custom-built tracks just to move it. Its shells could shatter bunkers and fortifications, but the weapon was so cumbersome that it was nearly useless in a fast-moving war. Then there was the Panzer VIII Maus, a super-heavy tank weighing nearly 190 tons. On paper, it was invincible. In reality, it was too heavy to cross most bridges, too slow to maneuver, and served more as a barely mobile gun turret than a true tank. Beyond these giants, German planners also greenlit projects that bordered on the bazaar. The Mistel program paired old aircraft frames with explosive warheads, turning them into flying bombs. The BA-349 Natter was essentially a manned rocket, its pilot strapped into a nose full of explosives with almost no chance of survival. The Mi-163 Comet pushed the envelope as the world's first rocket-powered fighter capable of breathtaking speed, but prone to catastrophic explosions that killed as many pilots as enemies. Even the BV-155, a long-winged high-altitude interceptor, never advanced beyond incomplete prototypes before the war ended. What all of these projects revealed was a kind of strategic instability. Rather than refining proven designs and building more of what already worked, Germany gambled on technological marvels. The hope was that one of these miracle weapons might suddenly change the course of the war. But in chasing these dreams, they poured precious time and resources into machines that looked impressive on paper, but rarely made an impact where it mattered most. The battlefield. While Germany chased massive cannons and rocket planes, the real threat in the skies was far more practical. By 1943 and 1944, Allied bombers were striking deep inside the Reich on a daily basis. Waves of B-17 flying fortresses and B-24 liberators roared over German cities and factories, raining destruction from altitudes above 20,000 feet. Guarding them were sleek, long-legged escorts like the P-51 Mustang, whose range and performance finally gave the Allies the upper hand. Here, the Luftwaffe faced a problem it could not ignore. Its best fighters, the FW-190A and the BF-109, were lethal at low and medium altitudes. But once they climbed beyond 20,000 feet, their engines lost power, and their performance fell away. 
against heavily armed bomber formations protected by Mustangs, that weakness became deadly. To make matters worse, German planners had heard reports of America's newest bomber, the B-29 Superfortress. In truth, the B-29 never saw combat over Europe, flying only in the Pacific. Yet its rumored ability to cruise near 30,000 feet fed German fears. If such a machine appeared over Berlin, the Luftwaffe had nothing that could touch it. That fear alone was enough to set engineers racing toward a new solution, a true high-altitude interceptor. When the Luftwaffe first introduced the Focke-Wulf FW-190A in 1941, it was an immediate success. Compact and powerful, driven by the BMW 801 radial engine, it combined speed, maneuverability, and heavy firepower in a package that quickly earned the respect of friend and foe alike. Many Allied pilots who first encountered the Butcher Bird, as it was nicknamed, admitted it was one of the most formidable fighters of the war. Yet the FW-190 had an Achilles heel. Its BMW 801 engine delivered excellent performance at low and medium altitudes, but above 20,000 feet the power dropped off sharply. That made it less effective against high-flying bombers, a problem that grew more serious as Allied raids intensified. To address the issue, German engineers began experimenting with new versions of the FW-190, each fitted with different power plants in the hope of unlocking better high-altitude performance. The FW-190B stayed with the BMW-801, but featured incremental improvements. In testing, the gains were minimal, and it was quickly abandoned. The FW-190C received the Daimler-Benz DB603 inline engine. On paper, this version showed real promise, with greater power and the potential for continued development. But the DB603 suffered from reliability issues and production difficulties. Finally came the FW-190D, powered by the Junkers Jumo 213. To accommodate the new engine and its annular radiator, the nose had to be lengthened and the tail extended for balance. In the end, the Luftwaffe chose the D model because the Jumo 213 was already in production, while the DB603 remained troublesome. For designer Kurt Tank, this was a disappointment. He favored the DB603 and dismissed the Dora as merely a stopgap, a bridge to something better. Although Kurt Tank dismissed the FW-190D as little more than a temporary fix, the pilots who actually flew it quickly discovered otherwise. At first, many were cautious. They had heard their chief designer speak of the Dora with little enthusiasm, calling it a stopgap on the way to a real high-altitude fighter. That kind of talk spread through the ranks, and some Luftwaffe flyers expected the D model to be sluggish or compromised. But the first time they strapped into the Dora and took it into combat, doubts melted away. The new Jumo 213 engine gave the plane a sharp boost in performance. Acceleration was crisp, climb rates were noticeably better, and top speed was significantly higher than the older A series. Even more surprising, despite the longer fuselage and added weight, the Dora could still turn with agility. Many pilots remarked that it actually handled more smoothly in a dogfight, giving them the edge against Allied fighters they once struggled to match. The shift in opinion was dramatic. What Tank had dismissed as a mere bridge became, in the eyes of its users, one of the finest fighters Germany ever built. The Dora earned a reputation as a thoroughbred, a machine that could hold its own against the best the Allies had to offer. In the end, the Luftwaffe's decision to put it into production proved to be not just practical, but inspired. While the Dora proved far better than expected, Kurt Tank still had his eyes set on something more ambitious. His true vision was a clean sheet design called the TA-153, a fighter meant to be the ultimate successor to the FW-190. The 153 would have introduced major structural changes, but that was exactly the problem. In 1943, the Reich Air Ministry was desperate to simplify, not complicate, production. 
Switching over to a completely new airframe meant halting established assembly lines, something Germany could no longer afford. The compromise was the TAW 152, a design that looked familiar but stretched the concept further. Instead of starting from scratch, Tank and his team modified the proven FW-190D airframe, lengthening the fuselage, reworking the wings, and adapting it to carry new high-performance engines. This way, the aircraft could be produced in existing factories with less disruption, while still aiming for the high-altitude performance Germany needed so badly. Several versions of the TA-152 were sketched out on paper, the TA-152A was to be the standard fighter, using the JUMO 213A. The TA-152B, with the JUMO 213E, was planned as a heavy fighter. The TA-152C, Tank's personal favorite, would use the Daimler-Benz DB603, carry heavier armament, and even haul bombs, doubling as a fighter bomber. But the most important variant was the TA-152H, the high-altitude model with an extended wingspan. This was the design that promised to take the fight back to the bombers flying far above Germany's reach. The TA-152 was, in essence, a stretched and refined FW-190, built to go higher, stay steadier, and fight where the older types could not. On paper, the differences look modest. In the air, they mattered. The production TA 152's fuselage measured roughly 35.5 feet long, about 10.82 meters, while the high altitude H variant carried enormously long wings, roughly 47.4 feet across, approximately 14.44 meters, versus the roughly 36.1 foot wings, approximately 11 meters, of the other models. That jump in wingspan is the single most obvious cue that the H was meant to live in thin air. Several airframe changes followed from that simple idea. The TA-152H received a noticeably larger vertical tail to improve directional stability at altitude, where control surfaces work in thinner air and yaw instability can be fatal. The cockpit was pressurized. An engine-driven compressor drew air from a radiator scoop, filtered it, and kept the cabin at a pressure equivalent to about 26,000 feet, so the pilot could breathe and function comfortably even when the airplane climbed well above that. Pressurization like this was a crucial enabling feature for sustained high-altitude operations. Under the cowling, the TA-152H typically used the JUMO 213E inline engine, and designers planned a pair of boost systems to cover the full envelope. MW-50, a methanol and water injection, provided extra low altitude power and improved acceleration. GM-1, a nitrous oxide system, was for thin air high altitude bursts of power. Other TA-152 variants might carry only one of these systems depending on roll. Armament and loadout reflected mission trade-offs. The H, optimized for sealing and range, carried lighter armament. 130mm cannon firing through the prop shaft and 220mm cannons in the wings, and usually no bomb load. It could take an external drop tank for extended range. The A and C fighters were more flexible, capable of additional wing guns and even about 1,100 pounds of bombs for fighter-bomber work. The B was the gunboat, 330mm cannons as standard, a heavy hitter that could also accept bombs. Put together, these changes made the TA-152H a specialist. Long wings, pressurized cockpit, dual boost systems, and a carefully chosen armament package, all tuned to rest control of the thin sky above the war. For all its promise on paper, the TA-152 entered the world under a cloud of rushed schedules and mechanical headaches. The first TA-152H prototype took to the air in July 1944. Its debut lasted only 36 minutes before disaster struck. One of the landing gear legs failed to lock properly. When the pilot attempted to bring it down, the gear collapsed, badly damaging the airframe and ending its career before any real evaluation could be done. 
A second prototype followed in August. This one managed over 10 hours of flight time, but it fared no better in the long run. Problems with the supercharger surfaced during high-altitude testing, and fuel pump failures added to the trouble. On its final flight, the engine caught fire, forcing the test pilot into a desperate attempt to land. He never made it. Both plane and pilot were lost. Later, prototypes avoided catastrophic crashes, but the results were still discouraging. Supercharging problems persisted, stability at altitude was marginal, and stall behavior was poor. Engineers also struggled to integrate the planned MW50 and GM1 boost systems together with additional fuel tanks in a single workable package. In most cases, they simply had not figured out how to make all the parts play well together. By late 1944, however, Germany was in no position to wait. With cities burning under Allied bombs, the Reich Air Ministry ordered the fighter into production anyway. By the time the first Ta 152 HS reached frontline units in early 1945, all four prototypes and 20 pre production machines together had logged barely 50 hours in the air. Production totals remain uncertain. Some records suggest as few as a dozen were built, others list more than 150. The most likely figure falls between 60 and 70. Combat records are equally thin. The TA-152 scored a handful of victories and suffered a handful of losses. Ironically, the high-altitude interceptor almost never flew at the altitudes it was designed for. Instead, it spent its brief service life fighting at medium and low levels, just another reminder of how desperation, not sound planning, drove its birth. On paper, the TA-152H looked like the ultimate piston engine fighter. With a top speed of about 472 miles per hour and a ceiling that touched 47,000 feet, higher than the vaunted B-29 Super Fortress, it seemed to offer everything Germany needed. It promised speed, altitude, and performance that could rival the very best fighters in the world. But reality told a harsher story. The plane arrived far too late with too few built to make any difference. Even the most generous estimates suggest fewer than a hundred saw service, and many of those never left the ground. In the final months of the war, production bottlenecks, fuel shortages, and collapsing infrastructure meant the TA-152 was more of a curiosity than a true frontline weapon. In hindsight, the Luftwaffe might have been better served by pouring its limited resources into the proven FW-190D, which pilots already loved and which could be built in greater numbers. Instead, the search for a miracle weapon spread engineers too thin and left Germany without enough of anything to matter. The TA-152 remains a symbol of late war desperation, an impressive design that carried enormous potential but never had the time or numbers to prove itself. Today it stands less as a war winner than as a reminder of wasted effort, one more entry in the long list of wonder weapons that promised salvation and delivered little. And as any modern YouTube storyteller might quip, if late war German planners could have strapped a jet engine to a cardboard box, they probably would have. If you enjoyed this look back at history's strangest fighter projects, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe keep these stories alive.